Amphibole sounds like the name of an obscure Pokemon, but it's actually a group of important rock forming minerals. But where do you find them? How do you spot them? What can they tell us about the Earth? And why would they be a toxic rock type Pokemon? Gotta catch them all. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Brooke Johnson and I'm a geologist that studies rocks that are billions of years old and the tiny fossils that we find in them. This channel is where I talk about geology, so if there's something you want me to talk about or make a video on, then stick a comment below or don't. It's not like I'm your internet geology dad. You can find me on all the social medias as Geology Johnson. The links to those and these Proterozoic Park shirts are available below. Money from the shirts will go towards the channel for things like being able to make slides we can look at together on the microscope, like long distance geology pals. On that note, subscribe, share and like the video. I hate doing this bit because it makes me feel like a dirty, dirty sellout, but the filthy social media overloads demand it as payment for sharing the video and showing it to new people. With that out of the way, let's crack on. Amphiboles are a big super group of minerals. There's currently 76 defined types with loads more that are a mixture of those types. We'll talk about that in a minute. The most well-known amphiboles are probably hornblende, which isn't even a single mineral, it's a messy subgroup of sub-subgroups within the main group. The other really famous type of amphiboles is asbestos, which is another messy grouping that can be hazardous to health, one of which isn't even an amphibole. We'll talk about both of these later though. Amphiboles are the most common in metamorphic and igneous rocks where they can be a major rock forming mineral. For example, amphibolites are often rich in amphiboles. It's nice when geologists give things sensible names. Amphiboles can also turn up in sediments, but they tend to be very rare in sedimentary rocks, and you can watch my video on sandstones to find out why that is. First, let's have a wee gander at the crystal structure of amphiboles. Amphiboles are inosilicates or chain silicates. Ino silicate, what you're thinking. How can the amphiboles be the chain silicates when the pyroxenes are the chain silicates? Well, sit down and I'll tell you. Pyroxenes are the single chain silicates, but amphiboles are the double chain silicates. And you know what they say, twice the chain silicate, twice the fun silicate. Because they're also inosilicates, amphiboles are very similar to pyroxenes in structure and chemistry. Like pyroxenes, amphiboles can have crystals in either the orthorhombic or monoclinic system, most of them though tend to be in the monoclinic system. Also like pyroxenes, the basic unit is this four-sided pyramid called a silica tetrahedra, which is composed of a silicon atom surrounded by four oxygen atoms, four of them. Oxygen likes to be friends with everyone, whether they like it or not. In an amphibole, we have two parallel chains of silica tetrahedra, where some of the oxygen atoms are shared between the chains at the points of the tetrahedra. Metal atoms can then attach to the other points in the tetrahedra or fit in the spaces between the tetrahedra. I said tetrahedra a lot. The double chain means that the amphibole molecules are literally twice the size of pyroxenes. Aside from the double chain of silica tetrahedra, the main difference between the amphiboles and pyroxenes are the volatiles. As well as metals, those big spaces between the tetrahedra can hold atoms of things like water in its hydroxyl form, uh, chlorine and fluorine, and these things would normally be gas or liquid. This means that you could think of amphiboles as long wet pyroxenes, and pyroxenes as short dry amphiboles. That's probably gonna upset some of my mineralogy colleagues if they hear me say that. The ability of amphiboles to carry volatiles like water is really important for earth processes, as we'll find out later. Amphiboles are so chemically variable that I'm not even gonna try and go through them all here. I'm not looking at any amphibole in particular, horn blend. Instead, as an example, here's the formula for the iron magnesium amphibole called Cummingtonite. Named after the town Cummington in the USA where it was first described. This bit here describes the basic silica double chain. Look at all that water. Amphiboles are thirsty boys. The amount of silica can vary a little bit in the double chain and sometimes you can substitute two of the aluminium atoms for two silicon atoms if you're feeling fancy. The rest of the formula in Cummingtonite is taken up by iron and magnesium. But you can even squeeze a cheeky bit of calcium in there if the moon's right. These formulas are idealized and there will usually be low amounts of other metals in natural samples like the calcium I just mentioned. That's why hornblende is such a messy subgroup. Even though they might look similar in hand specimen, they can have a lot of, a lot of chemical variability once you analyze them. This means the mineral we call hornblende is actually five series of different amphibole minerals that chemically grade into each other across a spectrum of compositions. That was a mouthful to say. For example, at one end, you might have magnesium hornblende, it's full of magnesium, relatively poor in iron. And at the other end, you have ferrohornblende, which is relatively rich in iron and 
purine magnesium. A horn blend you find in nature will have a chemical composition somewhere between these two end members. When a mineral can chemically grade between two or more end member compositions, it's called a solid solution. And lots of minerals can do this too, like felspars and pyroxenes, which I've talked about in other videos. Go and watch them. So now we've had a quick look at their structure and chemistry, what do amphiboles actually look like when you find them in the wild? Whereas pyroxenes are short and stubby, amphiboles tend towards acicular forms, which is a fancy way of saying long and thin. Long and thin. In hand specimen, if you get an amphibole in perfect end cross section, you'll see well-formed amphiboles, which we say are euhedral, have six sides compared to the eight sides of the pyroxene. It's one of the ways you can tell them apart. And that's because the double chains which connect at points of the tetrahedral, like I mentioned previously, form a weak point that gives the crystal cleavage planes that intersect at 120 degrees or thereabouts. And a cleavage plane just means a plane along which the crystal wants to naturally split. In hand specimen, amphibole crystals are often black, green or blue, but clear white and yellow and brown amphiboles are also known. All the colours of a very limited rainbow. Amphibole crystals usually have a vitreous luster. Sounds like a spell from Warcraft. But what it actually means is that they are reflective like glass and you might be able to see a little bit inside the crystal if it's big enough there so they're a little bit translucent but they can sometimes be dull or completely opaque as well. Amphiboles can often be found in the same rocks as tourmaline which can look quite similar. You can tell them apart though even if they're the same colour because tourmaline has a rounded triangular cross section and it has lines along the length of the tourmaline crystal which we call striations. Amphiboles can also be found in the same rocks as biotite mica, which also, when you see it from the side, looks long, thin and black in cross-section. And it's also very shiny. And you can tell amphibole apart from biotite because biotite's a phyllosilicate or a sheet silicate, which means it's very soft and flaky. You can scratch biotite with steel and even peel away sheets if it's a big enough crystal. But you can't scratch amphibole with steel and you certainly can't peel it apart the way you can with biotite mica. If you're able to access microscope slides and look at them with a geological microscope, then you can ID amphibole with the following characteristics. Check out my previous videos for details of how geological microscopes work and what the technical terms of these characteristics mean. In plain polarized light, amphiboles are brown, red, yellow, blue, bluish purple or green. Most of the ones I've seen are green though. They also have high relief, which means the mineral looks like it sticks up further from the minerals around it, even though they're all supposed to be flat. If you have a base lens section, you might be able to see those six sides and the 120 degree cleavage that I talked about earlier. You can see them in both the microscope and the hand specimen version. In cross polarized light, they usually have really bright sparkly interference colors. Amphibole also have an inclined extinction, which means they go black when the long axis of the crystal is at an angle to horizontal or vertical in the crosshairs when you're rotating stage of the microscope. If you don't do like petrography studies or you don't really need to worry about any of that stuff. So where do you find amphiboles? You can find amphiboles in lots of igneous rocks, including many that are used as decorative building stones, such as horn blending granite. Granitic rocks that are poor in aluminium will also have the blue amphibole called rebakite. The most famous rebakite granite is from Isla Craig in Scotland because it's used to make the official curling stones for the curling sport. You're welcome, Canada. You can also find horn blend in mafic igneous rocks like gabbro, dolerite and basalt and in intermediate igneous rocks like andesite. Amphiboles are also common in metamorphic rocks formed at medium to high grades. When I say grade, that refers to the combination of temperature and pressure the rock was metamorphosed at. Bear in mind, even low grade metamorphism is still hundreds of degrees centigrade and thousands of times the Earth's surface pressure. So you would die. So would I. We would all die. Probably edit that bit out. Horn blend is again really common in schists and gneisses, though at higher grades you also get tremolite and actinolite too. They're just different types of amphiboles, especially if the rock being metamorphosed was originally calcium and magnesium rich, like mafic igneous rocks, limestones and dolerites. Metamorphosed iron and magnesium rich rocks, such as iron formations, iron stones and mafic igneous rocks will contain amphiboles like anthophyllite, grunerite, gedderite, crocodilite and our pal coming tonight. Low temperature, high pressure metamorphic rocks formed in subduction zones usually form from the metamorphism of basaltic ocean crust and will often contain the blue sodium rich amphibole glaucophane. These glaucophane rich rocks are called blue schists, though they're not always blue in hand specimen, but when they are, they are spectacular. I got to see some in California along with eclogites and it was a dream come true. I'm such a nerd, but I don't care. Horn blend is also a product of contact metamorphism where an intrusive igneous rock heats and alters a pre-existing, usually sedimentary rock. 
A horn blend rich contact metamorphic rock is called a horn fells. The intergrown crystals make the rock really hard and can give you quite a jolt if you hit it with your hammer without realizing. High grade metamorphic rocks, which were originally mafic igneous rocks, may form an amphibolite, which is an am a metamorphic rock dominated by amphiboles. The type of amphibole formed though depends on the chemistry of the original rock. Some sandy and muddy limestones and dolerites or sedimentary rocks that contain volcanic ash can also become amphibolites too when they're subjected to high temperatures and pressures. Amphibolites that were originally igneous rocks are called orthoamphibolites while those were originally sedimentary rocks are called paraamphibolites. I'll have to do a separate video on metamorphic rocks and processes because it's like, it's too big to fit into one video. Amphiboles are also really common in serpentinized ophiolite. An ophiolite complex is where you've had a continent-continent collision and then the ocean crust and bits of the mantle get dragged up and squeezed up onto the continent one of the colliding continents. We call this process obduction as opposed to subduction. I've done videos about this previously, so you can go back and check those. The important thing to note though, is that this is a pretty warm, wet process, and that means you get hydrothermal metamorphism. So the dry, water-free pyroxenes get transformed into amphiboles, and the water-free olivines from the ultramafic mantle material get transformed into clays from the serpentine group. So I mentioned earlier that the amphibole chain is twice the size of a pyroxene chain. So that means that when you hydrate it and it expands, you've got a space problem because the crystal is trapped within that rock. So what happens is the rock around it fractures and shatters, and that creates planes of weakness that water can get along. And that means that you get more hydrothermal alteration of pyroxenes and of olivines, which causes more fracturing and shattering. And so that's why if you've ever seen ophiolite rocks, which are often called serpentinites, they have this beautiful uh, mottled, almost lizard-like scaly texture. It's really, really cool and you should check it out. I mentioned earlier that some amphiboles are grouped as asbestos. And you may have recognized the name asbestos as a substance that's harmful to human health, and it is very harmful. Asbestos is actually a group of six minerals with asbestiform crystals. Only five of those minerals are actually amphiboles, and that's amosite, crocodolite, tremolite, anthophyllite, and actinolite. The sixth mineral is a type of serpentine clay called chrysotile. Asbestos exposure harms human and animal health in two main ways. Firstly, asbestosis, where inhalation of the asbestos causes scarring of the lungs. The second is called mesothelioma, which is an aggressive and often fatal form of cancer that affects the mesothelial lining of internal organs. You do not want to get this, it's horrible. As I said, asbestiform minerals have this unique fibrous, fluffy, and sometimes powdery appearance. And chrysotile fibers can often be like quite curly. Amphiboles that are not in the fibrous asbestiform shape are generally safe to handle. Just don't do anything silly with them, like lick them, sniff them, put them in your mouth, or any other part of your body. Make sure you wash your hands after handling your samples and keep them in a sealed container. If you've been exposed to asbestiform minerals and are worried about your health or how to dispose of them, then contact your doctor and your local hazardous waste disposal authority. If you're out looking at rocks and minerals in an area of the serpentinized ophiolite, 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 or other hydrothermal metamorphism, and you see rocks and minerals with a fibrous asbestiform appearance, then it's best just to be cautious and leave them alone. It's okay to visit these places. For example, thousands of people visit the lizard ophiolite in Cornwall every year, including, I think, every single geology student ever. But just be careful and sensible and you'll be okay. So what can amphiboles tell us about earth processes? Water and other volatiles are involved in their formation, so they often indicate processes where hydration is occurring, such as in ophiolites, and in continental collisions and mountain building events. They also require more silica and aluminium than pyroxenes. So in igneous settings, they can indicate the melting and recycling of continental material, like in certain types of granites, or the concentration of these elements through the fractional crystallization of magma, like in intermediate volcanics. Where metamorphism has occurred, they can give us a lot of information about the original rock. For example, I'm currently studying some contact metamorphosed sedimentary rocks that are rich in anthophyllite, which tells me that the original sediment was unusually rich in iron and magnesium. So there you go, a quick beginner's guide to the amphibole mineral group. 
I hope you enjoyed that and you get to find some nice non-asbestiform amphiboles of your own soon. If you haven't already, subscribe, click the buttons, do the things. The more people that do this stuff, the more my videos get shared to people who like rocks and the more that you can share them with people that like rocks because sharing is caring. If you've got a topic you want me to talk about in a video, then let me know in the comments. Talk about most geology related things, except stereo nets. We don't do stereo nets here. Otherwise, have fun with your rocks, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Let's potatoes. I'm a dork. I like pointing. Smooth. Monoclinic. Pyramid. Pyramid. Why do I point so much? Thin. What's all that about, eh? Including, but not limited to, crocodilite, croco, I've seen the pictures, crocky dolite, absolutely bloody awful, crocodilite, don't forget, God, that's hard to say, don't forget, oh, Jesus Christ, crocky dolite, do the like and sub and subscribe, don't forget, if you'd like, don't forget to like, oh Jesus Christ, and you can give it to your geology pal, I really hate doing this place, oh my word, that was awful, a little bit of me died, <sighs> Tiny little trail and fell off. If you have a geology topic, if you have a geology topic, oh.